I think most of us have seen games like this. It's turn five or so, and a player is getting ready to go to attacks. Immediately, a chorus erupts from the would-be attacker's opponents. Come on, man. I don't have anything. Hey, don't attack me. I missed a land drop. Really? You're gonna attack me? My deck is just trying to be funny. I like to call this style of table engagement SBS, small bean syndrome, when a player goes out of their way to paint their deck as being in a bad spot and deserving nothing but mercy. Now, Commander's nature as a multiplayer format means that table politics naturally play a major role in a lot of games. In addition, a lot of people play EDH specifically for a less cutthroat MTG experience. Not everybody at every table is looking to win quickly, or even win at all. I'm not a big fan of most forms of small bean syndrome due to their tendency to discourage attacks and artificially lengthen games, but I can accept that not everybody is trying to play the same kind of EDH I am. However, there are also people who share my desire to play quicker and more cutthroat games, and who employ small bean syndrome more tactically. This may be intentional, but it also might not be, which brings me to a major reason for SBS's existence, deck inconsistency. If somebody has an inconsistent deck, one with some powerful and or explosive cards, but a lack of support or connective tissue for such cards, there will naturally be moments of popping off and moments of the opposite of popping off. This means that such a player can be telling the truth when they say they're having a whiff moment, but this can still be a deception in some sense of the word. Let's try an exercise real quick. Here's a graph of their deck's performance, with the y-axis being power and the x-axis being percentile of power at a given moment. You know, 20% of the time they'll be at least this level of powerful. 80% of the time they'll be at least this much lower quantity of powerful. Make sense? No? Great. You obviously got this moderately small percentage of the time where their deck is going absolutely ham, doing whatever it is the powerful decks do, but also this gulf back here where their deck is farting around doing nothing. Certainly, they're having a bad time here, but this is often a situation arising from deck building choices. A deck that dedicates too much space to the synergistic and the explosive will have some big turns and occasionally massive wins, but also a lot of moments where it withers to a single removal spell or just can't quite put the pieces of the puzzle together. These moments could be made less frequent by running more of that connective tissue, more filtering, more small-scale draw, and more creatures and low-cost interaction spells to protect themselves. If they're ramping to big cards, they could run a larger proportion of small-scale ramp spells in their deck so that they successfully ramp where they want to be more than 40% of the time. When a person is piloting a sort of all-or-nothing deck, small bean syndrome is a form of power level smoothing, a way of papering over the power crater they made for themselves and bolstering these weakest moments. And I don't mean this as an attack necessarily. If this sounds like you, please, take this as deck building advice. A related concept to small bean syndrome is people who don't verbally talk down their game state, but who do play in a way that conceals how well they're doing. Now, at a CEDH table, this is the norm, as it should be at that power. You're trying to win a cutthroat game of magic against other people trying to win even more cutthroatedly, and you have every right to bluff, to downplay your game state, and to otherwise engage in low-level deception. At a more middling power level, though, this might not be the best way to go. If you're playing a deck with a clear win con, people might know what to expect even if they're a bit scared about it, but if you're playing a deck whose wins result from weird tech pieces interacting to create unexpected avalanches of value and board state, well, people might get a bit apprehensive. When a deck is doing a lot of things, but it's unclear how it wins, people may be asking themselves the question, oh god, is it that? Or is it that? Additionally, there are some strategic ways of playing that might involve saving resources and trying to force other people to use interaction first. You might say to yourself, hmm, that card is spooky, but if I bluff no removal, somebody else might deal with it, and then they'll have less removal when I want to do something spooky later. My friend Mr. Hans calls this playing like a nerd, and though it's decent from a strategic standpoint, it's the kind of slightly ratty play style that people will eventually catch on to. Whether or not you get punished for playing shady or playing nerdy will depend on the table, but you should keep in mind that human beings have a natural tendency to fear the unknown, even if being unknown might feel like the correct play. For an example of a deck that performs almost the opposite way, let's talk about my Glissa deck. I talk about it a lot, and I will do so again here. The deck consists of ramp, draw spells, removal, and big creatures. No bursty wins, no surprises, and no weird tech pieces or out-of-place synergy cards hogging space. There's nothing spicy with the commander either, she just adds draw to improve consistency, 
and is a good blocker to help with survivability. The deck simply does its battlecruiser thing. People who've played against the deck know that's what it does, and if people ask me what it does, well, that's what I'll tell them. If I'm currently behind while playing that deck, well guess what? When I get back on my feet, you can expect more ramp, draw, big creatures, and removal. Get ready. It's a very consistent deck, and it's also what I'll call a transparent deck. By this I mean you can always approximate how well it's doing by looking at the board state, cards in hand, and land count of the deck. If the deck has a big board, well, the threat is right there. No extreme synergies or combos to worry about later. If the deck has a lot of cards in hand, there's a good chance it's packing a lot of removal. If the deck has a big land count, there are all sorts of moderately scary things you need to worry about, but the odds of the spookiest outcomes are lessened the fewer cards in hand the deck has. It's a powerful deck against a lot of conventionally built min-power decks, I call it mid-range Crusher 5000 for a reason, but the transparency and absence of sudden win cons means that people tend to worry about it less than they probably should. Another transparent deck I have is my Maria deck, and though that one has more unique tech and response plays, it's transparent because it's a Voltron deck. The problem is right there on the board in front of you. If there's a Maria on board with a lot of equipments, I'm doing pretty well. Most of my draws will be exiles off the top, so you're seeing most of the stuff I'm seeing. The scary stuff is all visible. There might be some protection spells in my hand, but the deck devotes a full 10% of its space to protection, so that much shouldn't be a shock. Maria also has the advantage over Glissa that it's low to the ground. My deck can create a value engine with its commander to exile cards, but that value is more small artifacts and creatures, and the deck doesn't do much if the artifact count is low or if the commander gets removed. Even with a high artifact count, the deck still only hits one player a turn and gains maybe 4 cards worth of value. My $25 Rakdos discard deck is even lower to the ground, only incrementally drawing cards with a handful of scrappy creatures, and honestly, that's the deck's only saving grace. It deletes people's hands and makes them upset, but the rest of the deck is just grindy creatures and a commander to clear the way for my small group of 2 twos and 3 threes to attack. People will sometimes attack it out of spite for a bit, but the non-discard portion of the deck is so utterly fair magic that people will usually go, oh, you're just doing that now. Huh and won't worry about it too much. All three of these decks pair well with a style of table engagement I like to call fight the table ideology. They can happily admit to exactly what they plan to do, they can do it fairly consistently, and they are prepared for the consequences if they become an enemy. Me and Mr. Hans originally coined this phrase to describe the optimal playstyle for mixed power level games, or alternatively, games where one player gets a decisive advantage early. If you're playing more powerfully than other people, you could play close to the chest before popping off with a power turn and deleting the table, but that's not really fun for anybody. However, give your opponents the information they need to know and be open about the general shape of what your deck is doing, specifically how it wins and what cards you're playing are doing there, and suddenly you've got a dynamic game where your opponents are strategizing about how to keep you in check while managing their own individual plans. Any deck can partake in this ideology in a game playing against lower power decks, and I encourage giving it a try, but as a method, it also works as a more general style of deck building and play. Now I can already hear some of you say, But Alex, why would I want to be the enemy? I don't want my life total to be yeeted into the sun by a bunch of quivering nerds who I've been smugly informing of their impending demise at the hands of my deck. Well first, if you are in the dominant position, doing literally that can lead to some really fun gameplay as long as you're not an ass about it. But more broadly, this method can actually save your deck from some hate, and let's talk about that. This might seem odd for hate dodging, but step one of fight the table ideology is that you should pose some sort of clear threat to the table with a good degree of consistency. This could be early damage, big mid-game beats, board wipes, stacks, and so forth. This will mostly come down to building a deck that's focused and isn't filled with unnecessary tech pieces or creatures out of sync with the game plan, and you can accomplish this step on a shockingly low budget. The point of this step is that what you're doing needs to be visible. To go back to an earlier point, I've seen hyper-techy mid-range decks which fill their board with unusual permanence with no clear sense of how they'll be used. If you do this, people might feel a looming sense of threat, but with no obvious sense of what to worry about, this might simply result in them attacking you. By contrast, if the threat is visible, people can make their own educated calculations, and that calculation might just be, eh, it's probably fine. Similarly, consistency is important because that will be baked into people's calculations as well. If we take the inconsistent explosive deck I was talking about earlier and average out the power, it might very well be lower than a deck engaging in fight the table ideology. But people aren't going to be thinking about averages, they're going to be thinking about the fact that you swung at them for 90 on turn 5 last game, 
And that's a lot scarier than a deck that consistently swings for 15. Step two of Fight the Table ideology is to be open about the threat that your deck poses to the table. This doesn't mean you need to overhype yourself or give people constant updates on your draws, but be straightforward with people. Verbally, this could mean saying, yeah, my deck generates a lot of artifact tokens, which I can use to accomplish various effects. I don't have very many right now, so I'll need to get a lot more and have an outlet for them before I can do anything too scary. In terms of play, being open can just mean having a thing you're clearly doing. Don't let your opponents imagine what you're doing with all of these fishy plays. Have a goal, and execute clear steps along the way. One easy example for this is hardcore ramp decks, which work well because everybody knows they're scary at a lot of mana, but there's no singular land drop that signals the deck being a problem. It evokes more of a gentle gradient of concern from your opponents, rather than the black and white concern of a random spooky permanent, and this can lead to the deck flying under the radar. This is doubly true if you're not running a singular win card like Torment of Hailfire, but rather a win involving multiple cards used in a complex way, since that can kind of just blend together in people's minds as, yeah, the deck does big things when it gets a lot of mana, which is conceptually less scary than a one-shot. This sort of ramp deck is a great example of transparency being unexpectedly effective at avoiding attacks compared to more opaque playstyles. I've laid out the basic framework, but a natural question that might arise is, can my deck be played this way? I do my best to play decks that are relatively consistent, so a lot of mine do end up following this mold, but even in my case, some decks will be trickier to do this with than others. Decks with combos are generally more difficult to do this with, as they're naturally less transparent due to the level of importance they place on cards in hand, which is by definition a hidden zone. For this reason and others, sometimes a deck isn't a great candidate for this kind of transparency treatment. However, I think that a good exercise for every deck is thinking about what it would have to do to become a good candidate for this. What happens if you remind your opponents of the strongest win con in your deck, along with the conditions required to get there, right at the start of every game? What happens if your opponents treat that win con you mentioned seriously? If your deck is sometimes a slow mid-range deck, and other times an explosive combo list, well, that might be something to interrogate a bit more. I have a couple other things to say about playing like a nerd and other forms of pseudo-politics, but I couldn't find a nice place to fit them into this video. Instead, I posted them in a three minute long unlisted video. I've left a link to that video in my description, and it'll likely stay there for a while, but eventually I'm going to edit it out. After that, you can find that video over on my Patreon, and there's a good chance I'll post more endnotes like that over there, along with occasional full-length bonus videos. Sign up at patreon.com slash salubriousnail for $3 a month if more content sounds up your alley.